Greetings. Welcome to Virgin Orbit third quarter 2022 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I'd now like to turn the conference over to your host, Stephen Zhang, Vice President, Investor Relations. You may begin. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to Virgin Orbit's third quarter 2022 earnings call. Conducting the call today are Dan Hart, Chief Executive Officer, and Brita O'Rear, Chief Financial Officer. During today's call, we may make certain forward-looking statements. These statements are based on current expectations and assumptions, and as a result, are subject to risks and uncertainties. Many factors could cause actual events to differ materially from the forward-looking statements made on this call. For more information about these risks and uncertainties, please refer to the risk factors in the company's filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, which are made by Virgin Orbit from time to time. Readers are cautioned not to put any undue reliance on forward-looking statements, and the company specifically disclaims any obligation to update the forward-looking statements that may be discussed during this call. Please also note that on today's call, we will refer to certain non-GAAP financial information that we view as important in assessing the performance of our business. You can find reconciliations of the non-GAAP financial measures with the most comparable GAAP measures in our earnings press release and presentation materials that are available on the investors page of Virgin Orbit's website. With that, I'll turn the call over to Dan. Thank you, Steve. Good afternoon to everybody on the line and thank you for joining us for the third quarter 2022 earnings conference call. Today I would like to begin with our recent accomplishments followed by our upcoming launch activities, the scaling of our business and expanding geographical reach, and I'll end with the latest on business development growth and our key priorities before I turn the call over to Brita for a closer look at the numbers. Let's begin with a quick look at the highlights in the quarter. On July 1st, we executed our fourth launch. The mission continued our track record of 100% mission success over our first 18 months of operations. This brings a total of 33 satellites precisely delivered into our customers' target orbits. We've had significant activity in our international spaceport sector with the signing of agreements across several countries, including Australia and South Korea, and just this past month with Luxembourg. On the revenue side, we saw a significant increase in the quarter with over $30 million recognized a testament to the dedicated Virgin Orbit team and execution on backlog. This includes the straight-up mission, in addition to proprietary launch service activities. And finally, having deployed the Launcher One system to Cornwall, we have demonstrated the mobility and flexibility of our launch platform, which is a key differentiator of our Launcher One solution. Now let's get into the details. Our third quarter began on a very strong note when we delivered seven satellites to lower Earth orbit for the United States Space Force. This was our fourth successful launch. We have now demonstrated the robustness of our system and its ability to execute in a range of weather conditions and various orbits. In addition, our system has shown responsiveness and launch operation by delivering customer payloads to their precise orbits early in the launch window. On October 11th, Nuki Airport in Cornwall was transformed into an air and space port when we successfully deployed our launch system and activated the site for space launch activities. Our upcoming Cornwall launch will come with many firsts. The first orbital launch from UK soil, the first orbital space port in Western Europe, and the first of many international launches for Virgin Orbit. Through air launch, we can quickly and efficiently turn airports into spaceports and open sovereign launch capabilities across the world where traditional ground launch may not be possible or practical. Our activities in Cornwall form a blueprint for other allied nations, which will aid them in developing spaceport capabilities supporting their local space economies and government needs. The flight manifest for Start Me Up includes payloads from seven different programs demonstrating our global reach and diverse customer base. 
On the commercial side, we're opening space to a wide range of customers with missions across space-based manufacturing, maritime domain awareness, global navigation systems, and general Earth observation. In this heightened geopolitical environment, the U.S. and the U.K. are using this mission to further their collaboration as allies in the space domain. Air Launch provides the responsiveness and flexibility needed to preserve vital access to space. Recent rhetoric threatening satellite service and actions in Ukraine have demonstrated that space is both a critical and contested environment. Participating in this launch are organizations including the UK Ministry of Defense, the Royal Air Force, the US National Reconnaissance Office, and the US Space Force. In addition, the Royal Air Force is leading a scenario-based exercise using Launcher 1 to demonstrate how the unique capabilities of our system can provide options in response to a variety of potential world events. The arrival of our air launch system in Cornwall has attracted significant attention from the UK space community, government, media, and even royalty who recognize our mobile system as a key element of the UK's space strategy and as an enabler for the local space ecosystem. Turning now to, to new business, we recently announced a multi-launch agreement with Spire Global, who operates the world's largest multi-purpose satellite constellation. As a reminder, we demonstrated the flexibility of Launcher One's rapid call-up capabilities with the quick turnaround and late payload integration of Spire satellite on board our January mission. Building on that success, we are now teaming up in a broader capacity to provide launch options and solutions for Spire and their global customer base. We've expanded our geographic reach with the addition of spaceport agreements in Australia, Luxembourg, and South Korea. In Australia, our agreement with Wagner Corporation, one of the region's leading property and infrastructure development companies, establishes a partnership whereby we will engage with government and local stakeholders to further the development of a national mobile launch capability in Australia. The partnership seeks to certify Wagner's Toowoomba Wellcamp Airport as a national spaceport and to perform an orbital launch demonstration in early 2024. Last month, we were hosted by the Defense Minister of Luxembourg and the U.S. Ambassador. During our meeting, we signed an agreement to begin a collaborative effort whereby Luxembourg, a key logistics hub for NATO, would add Launcher One capabilities to their portfolio. The goal is to provide a mobile air launch system with responsive space capabilities for NATO partners and other allies across Western Europe. And in South Korea, we are under contract with JSpace to define the operational requirements and the industrial support needed to launch satellites from South Korea. This cooperative effort is designed to act as a catalyst to the Korean small satellite and space solutions market, stimulate local economic growth, and provide the South Korean government with a flexible and responsive launch capability in support of a wide range of mission applications. We continue to expand globally, demonstrating our growing international reach as our differentiated air launch technology continues to attract widespread interest. As we've shown in Cornwall, we can transform airports into spaceports, capitalizing on existing infrastructure and minimizing local environmental impacts, a major improvement over blasting off from traditional ground launch complexes. For some of these countries, our technology is the only option to enable launch safely from their borders. We're now in discussion or have agreements with over 13 countries across the globe and expect to book additional firm orders in the near term. The market has taken notice of the execution we've demonstrated with 100% mission success across our first four missions. On the national security side, working under contract for the Missile Defense Agency, we have confirmed the utility of the Launcher One system for hypersonic development and missile defense target applications. Follow-on work is active with our objective being a full-scale demonstration, followed by a growing cadence of mission support and services. We continue to work closely 
across the national security community to enable tactically responsive space through our air launch technology, which has recognized distinct advantages in this mission area. Our strategy includes capturing launch contracts for high-value payloads, resulting in increased revenues. By evolving our processes as we ramp our launch cadence, we're driving to the required certifications while working closely with NASA and the Space Force. Looking internationally, with the growing interest in the number of agreements we've signed across the spaceport sector, this new market is shaping up to be a major growth area. On the commercial side, we've seen increasing interest from the satellite community and more notably from more established space providers such as Spire. We are actively engaged with several others for multi-launch agreements. We see strong activity across market segments with approximately half a billion in active proposals, of which several decisions are expected in the coming months. These proposals, in addition to our MOU and LOI agreements, are approaching a billion dollars of total opportunities. Overall, we continue to capitalize on our position in the growing space sector by targeting commercial multi-launch agreements, international spaceports, high-value government payloads, responsive launch, and other national security missions. Now turning to our priorities for the balance of the year. Our first priority is to drive mission success through flawless execution and fulfill our commitments to our customers. To this end, our team is on site with our rocket underwing in Cornwall. We are proceeding through our launch campaign as we continue to work to obtain the necessary regulatory approvals in the UK. We are now expecting three launches this year, driven by the timing of regulatory approvals, our efforts to obtain certifications for high-value payloads, and satellite readiness. As we ramp up, we continue to see operational efficiency improvements resulting in higher production rates and lower cost. For instance, the time between launch and the next rocket delivered for launch was reduced by approximately 50% for our current mission as compared to the previous. And finally, we are building on our mission success, differentiated capabilities, and market reach to expand our backlog. All of this is enabled by our talented, world-class Virgin Orbit team. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Brita to walk you through the results in more detail. Brita? Thank you, Dan, and good afternoon, everyone. Moving to our financial results on slide 17, we recorded $30.9 million of revenue in the quarter. This was driven by our most recent launch, in addition to recognized revenues for other proprietary mission unique launch service activities, as well as funded studies. We are more than just a launch platform. Other revenue streams encompass customer funded R&D, planning and activating spaceports, ground support equipment, studies, and special mission services. Adjusted EBITDA for the third quarter of 2022 was aligned with our expectations and a loss of $42.9 million, driven mainly by the cost of goods sold associated with the higher revenue. We saw improving gross margin percentages through higher revenues in launch, services, and studies. Another positive contributing factor was our continued progression down the learning curve resulting in additional efficiencies. Adjusted EBITDA excludes items such as the impact of depreciation and amortization, stock-based compensation, and fair value adjustments. We've included a reconciliation table to adjusted EBITDA in our appendix. Free cash flow for the third quarter of 2022 was an outflow of $52.5 million. This was a 6% improvement compared to the prior quarter as we had higher collections and continue to realize cost reduction gains. We are activating our state-of-the-art engine test stands in addition to investing in our production ramps and have just completed our next generation ground support equipment, which is in operation at Cornwall. Turning to our full year guidance, as Dan mentioned, we expect to launch three times in 2022 as we focus on executing our strategic Cornwall launch and work with our customers on the timeliness of spacecraft availability. On the revenue side, 
we have already secured the lower end of our previous outlook range and are holding the top end range of $40 million. Our launch operations execution to date gives us confidence in our revenue outlook. No change to our free cash flow outlook as we continue to expect an outflow this year in the range of $220 to $230 million. This reflects our focus to manage cash as we continue to expect second half free cash flow to be favorable compared to the first half. Sequentially, in Q4, we are projecting higher working capital, mainly associated with the production ramp, with offsets from additional contract signings in the corresponding cash receipts. Looking ahead, similar to this year, we expect continued higher revenues per launch as we execute on our backlog and drive mission assurance certifications to deliver higher value payloads. We will also continue to serve our government customers with diverse, highly specialized missions and services. On the international side, we expect to continue to execute spaceport agreements and demonstrate the value of our unique mobile system. In terms of launch rate, we are targeting to more than double our launch rate next year as we focus on production ramps while building upon and extending our firm backlog. In addition to launch, we will continue to expand into market adjacencies in international spaceports, missile defense targets, and hypersonics. Operational execution, market penetration and expansion, and disciplined cash management will be key for us next year as we drive towards becoming free cash flow break-even in 2024. Finally, I want to touch on cash as we continue to bolster our financial position through a variety of efforts. We have strong backing from our current shareholders as demonstrated by the recent $25 million convertible investment from Virgin Investments, a part of the Virgin Group. We finished the quarter with cash and cash equivalents of just over $71 million. The recent $25 million investment is in addition to this balance. We will be opportunistic in the capital markets to fund our growth. Operationally, we continue to win new business and execute on our existing backlog, which will generate cash as we increase launch rate and drive costs down, improving our gross margins. In addition, capturing new higher value order provides working capital benefits and cash receipts. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time and will now turn the call back over to Dan. Thank you, Brita. At this point, we'd like to open the line up for questions. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question or comment at this time, please press star 1 1 on your telephone keypad. If your question has been answered or you wish to, once again, if you'd like to ask a question at this time, please press star 1 1 on your telephone keypad. Please stand by while we compile the QA roster. Okay, looking good here. Our first question or comment Virgin comes Orbit. from the line of John Roy from Water Tower Research. Mr. Roy, your line is open. Great. So, Dan, obviously there's a lot of momentum on the international side and on the space defense side. I wondered how this is impacting the team internally, your ability to hire, and also on your interactions with sales prospects. Well, I mean – the, the act of doing new and exciting things is a plus when it t- comes to, you know, exciting the, the workforce and bringing in uh, the community. And that's what really we've seen. Um, so we've got a lot of energy going there. We have a team here in the UK um, doing something that's the first time in history. Um, if you walk down the street um, in Nuki and you're wearing a red Virgin Orbit jacket, um, You'll, you'll get a, a, a happy hello because the community knows that, that there's something new happening and that, and that all filters into the, the workforce. Um, we'll continue to do first as a company, and that's to demonstrate our differentiation as an air launch platform um, and, and drive open markets, which is what you're seeing really in the international and the, uh, and the defense side as well. And as maybe as a quick follow-on, what are you seeing are your limits to your growth? I mean, I know you're still working on making sure that everything works 100%, but 
but um, what are what is kind of inhibiting you from necessarily growing faster? You know, I I think we you know the the, the operational ramp up is is critically important. It's got a lot of our focus, and you know at this point in, in the company that it's it's um, it's supply limited. Um, and and we need to be very mindful that you know you're as good as your as your last launch, and and you know we're thrilled with the four successful launches we we've, we've just had, um, but we've got to we've got to mind our 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 mission assurance focus and and our technical uh, activities as the factory ramps up and make sure that we we keep that recipe and can and drive it forward. Great, thanks. Thank you. Our next question or comment comes from the line of Scott Duchel from Credit Suisse. Mr. Duchel, your line is open. Thank you for taking my questions. Rita, can you um, disaggregate revenue and COGS between launch and other activities? Hey, Scott. I, I'm assuming you're referring to our Q3 revenue of the $30 million. And so in, in, their, in yeah. that in that value, as we discussed during our last um, earnings call in Q2, we do have the higher value launch revenue. And in addition to that, we also have some launch-related service activities in addition to some study activity. And that's really comprising the, the revenue mix that, that we have in the Q3. In regards, okay, to, in regards to, to the margin, uh, you're, you're going to see that on the on the launch services related activity, there is some higher higher revenue revenues there and margin. Um, but I'm not going to get too much into the detail of the launch versus non-launch cogs or, or margins. But it's it's fair to say that our launch margin is is lower, um, and it's really looking at where we are in the initial rate of production, and we expect our launch margins. To continue to improve. Of course, as we come down the learning curve, um, as we increase our rate and we scale, and then we'll also uh, gain economies of, of scale. So what you're seeing in the quarter is really a blended result. Got it. So would it be fair to say, I guess, without getting into the details, that the COGS per launch have continued to improve with the rate that you, you've expected it to improve over the past, call it six to nine months? You continue to see the learning curve progression that you that you've hoped for. Yes, we we are seeing we are continuing to see um, efficiencies being gained there um, as as we continue to scale. Okay, and then Dan, can you talk a bit about TAC RS and what your options are there at this point? You know, are you considering protesting the award, or do you want to kind of preserve the customer relationship and, and not go that route right now? You know. I mean, clearly, tactically responsive launch is a, a, a key market area for us, and we're going to work um, and continue to work closely with that customer. Um, you know, we we see that uh, it's highly valued. Um, we 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 were rated um, really very very high in our technical and and natural capabilities of the system. Um, and, and and so we were very encouraged by that. Obviously, we're disappointed in, in the loss um, um, at, uh, at this point. We're, we're at this point. We don't anticipate a protest, uh, but we um, we're instead we're working very closely with that customer to bring forward a solution which we think will be a game changer for them. Okay, makes sense. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next question or comment comes from the line of Edison Yu from Deutsche Bank. Just a second, please. Mr. Yu, your line is open. Hey, thank you. Thank you for taking the questions. First, what is your latest take on, on pricing? I, I know you're hoping to, to double launches next year. Do you have any sense of where, where pricing is trending for, for that activity? Well, I think we've got a a really a wide specter of different customers with different value propositions. You know, you've got, um, we're seeing stability uh, in the commercial market where, uh, as I think we mentioned in the call, you know, multi-launch uh, agreements are, are being discussed. Um, 
And and what we're seeing is, you know, the the companies that are are in operations, um, you know, are driving a good value um, for for their customers. In addition, you're seeing developments in the national security arena. Um, and with our differentiated capability, you know, we have not only uh, a traditional launch, but as we just discussed, tactically responsive launch, as well as as inroads into hypersonic R&D and missile defense target areas, which other launchers, you know, don't have nearly as much of a um, an opportunity for. And so, you know, those specialized government areas, uh, you know, carry um, uh, carry a higher value. And and as, as Brita mentioned in in the call as well, you know, um, there are different pedigrees of rockets uh, and launch systems. And what we're doing is we're pursuing um, the higher class certifications for NASA as well as the Space Force to allow us to gain um, access to launching high value payloads, which which you know yield higher revenues as well. Um, so you know that's that's kind of how the the overall landscape looks. And you know overall, you know we uh, we see a, a good value for a product. Thanks. And separate topic, clearly a lot of momentum on, on international. Um, any sense to, to provide some sort of range on what those opportunities could end up manifesting to be? Uh, I'm not, not going to try to pinpoint a specific number, but um, some, some sort of rough approximation of what those things could, could potentially lead to one day. Thanks. Well, I can, I can certainly describe, let me describe the the overall approach, and I think that'll give you some insights. And again, I mean, we're seeing a huge amount of interest um, and a lot of um, of agreements that we've started to enter into. And as well, I, I happen to be sitting in the UK right now, uh, having having just walked down a, um, a what used to be a blank slab of cement uh, in, in at Newquay Airport is now a, a, an air and space port. Um, but you know our proposition is is to come over and really be part of the that's space my home system and provide just a minutes from my home um, there there you know and there are obviously commercial as well as government purposes at work um, and it's always the most powerful when those come together you know commercial and government purposes I mean that's how space grew up in the u s um, you know our services um, vary from um, a campaign and doing a launch uh, to something um, like what we're doing here, where there's ground equipment and some infrastructure associated with it, and we can we can sell and uh, maintain uh, infrastructure, uh, ground equipment that services and fuels a rocket, to um, an airplane that's permanently stationed and um, and and supplying a full turnkey system. And we're having discussions with different nations on different levels of support that way. Um, but you know, obviously, we're we're most focused on the latter, and and you know, those are the constituent pieces. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question or comment comes from the line of Josh Sullivan from Benchmark Company. Stand by. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, as far as the regulatory process with the, with the UK spaceport, you know, what are the remaining large tent poles that, that you see? You know, we we don't have any um, you know major issues at at play. I mean, this is the first space launch ever from the UK. Um, there's a, a new set of regulations. There's a new team. Um, you know, we've been working very closely with them, and it's just taken time. Um, you know, I think there will be a lot of lessons learned from this that will help shore up the process. Um, I'm hoping, uh, and I think there's been a lot of uh, some good discussion about trying to bring more commonality between the U.S. and the U.K. and maybe other nations' processes so that, you know, documentation and, and various things are not done in, in multiple ways. Um, but, you know, I mean, the good news is we don't see a showstopper or a, like a big issue we're working, um, but it, it's, it is taking longer than, and, and, than we had anticipated, and, and it is taking a bit more 
effort than we anticipated as well. And, and just on that commonality comment, I mean, are, are the other regions like, like Poland and elsewhere watching the process from afar? Yeah, very much so. Um, there are a number of countries watching and learning, um, you know, and I think, you know, this, this activity will help us form a, pl a blueprint that we can apply, um, you know, again and again. And, and then just on, on the Spire multi-launch relationship, can you just provide some color there? You know, how, how do you think you, you won that contract and then, um, you know, any other aspects to it that you might provide? Well, you know, Spire is a really dynamic, forward-leaning, uh, innovative company. Um, I'd say probably the, the biggest thing that started this is, uh, as, as I mentioned, was um, last uh, December, we were um, getting ready for our launch and, and uh, our team got a call from um, uh, the Spire team and they had a satellite that was waiting for a launch um, at another uh, launch provider. And, and they really were ur urgently needing it to get up. Um, our, our, our GNC team looked at our our um, performance and our orbit, and they said, you know, we could do this. Um, to the FAA's credit, I, I, I mean, we called them, and within a week, they said, you know, we're okay if you add that spacecraft. And uh, three weeks later, they were in orbit. So that started the discussion. Um, and, you know, and then it's a matter of our um, launch record, um, our responsiveness, and, and, and our value proposition. Uh, and, and then just lastly, on, on the comment, you know, looking for break even by, by 2024, you know, what do you think are the major, um, you know, need to have to get there? And then, then maybe what are, what are some of the risks around it? You know, again, you know, as I said before, I think the ramp up is our key focus right now. Um, and so we are seeing good signs. Our, um, the rocket that's currently down the street from here and getting ready to launch came out of the factory um you know in half the time uh from the last launch than the one before that so we're seeing some good nice bright spots like that we got to continue to push it um it, we haven't had any big supply chain issues but balancing out your feeder lines into your factory are important so all those operational activities are are ongoing you know and then what well, we we we, we want to see and, and we're working hard on and making progress on are, are these certifications um, which I think help help your operations help your mission assurance but also give confidence to customers so that they can put their high value payloads on your system we did just get ISO 9000 certification um, a, a two three four months back uh, we're working on the other pedigree and items um, so those pieces uh, you know, and then just then it's really just expanding into the markets we described. Great. Thanks for the time. Thanks. Thank you. Stand by. Our next question or comment comes from the line of Austin Muller from Canaccord Genuity. Mr. Muller, your line is open. Hi. Good afternoon, Dan and Brita. Hi, Austin. Hi. Uh, so, I mean, Virgin will have three launches this year, uh, and given that Long Beach can build a, at a, a sort of maximum build rate around 20 rockets per year, what do you see as key bottlenecks keeping you from ramping the, the number next year closer to two times the current, which would be maybe like six to eight? Is it more the supply side or more the demand payload readiness side? It's really mainly the supply side. It is going through that ramp. I mean, we have the capacity, um, but what we what you do as you as you go through what you know L rip typically low rate initial production is you make improvements. You make you you find whatever weak points there are in your components, in your build, in your tooling, um, and you improve on those. And so, you know, any change is usually a headwind against ramping, but those changes are important because they give you a, a more efficient build process overall. And for the long term, they give you um, a more capable and, and more um, uh, reliable product in the long term, too. So 
you know, as we go through, we we will make and we are making you know small changes like that to make sure that um, the, the 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 factory runs efficiently and and the and the product is is uh, reliable. And you know, if you look at big companies who make airplanes and things, they sometimes call those those early vehicles you know they're teenagers. Um, they they take a little bit longer. And and but they it pays off as you get into rate because then your rate really picks up and so we're right in that steady phase where we are ramping but you know we we're, we'll hit a knee in the curve once some of these uh, developments and changes are done. Okay, that makes sense. And and one more, uh, can you talk about the status of the L3 Harris upgrade work on the two new 747 motherships? You know, we've been really focused mostly on the ramp. Um, we will we will probably defer the the, the mothership um, a bit as we as we really focus on ramp. We we do not need it, you know, for another year and a half to two years, um, given the capability of Cosmic Girl. Um, at the same time, we're keeping them warm. We do have some customers. Uh, who are interested in um, also having aircraft. And so, you know, as we expand in the market uh, and get signals there, we have the ability to ramp those up quickly. Okay, great. Thank you for the, the color there. Thank you. I'm showing no additional questions in the queue at this time. I'd like to turn the conference back over to management for any closing comments. Well, let's see. I'd like I'd just like to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh it's an exciting time uh for the company. I happen to be in Cornwall right now having just left the team uh as we're turning wrenches on an airfield. Um and um yeah, stay tuned. Uh we um we'll be pressing forward and uh we'll keep everybody informed. Everybody have a great day. <laughs>